say hey. So today we're going to be looking at some United States Chess Federation tournament rules, all the basic essential rules that I recommend students know, and some etiquette, the unspoken things that uh, tournament players learn, some of the nomenclature, you know, stuff. So this is coming from chapter 13 from my book, Whoop. Become a Chess Champion, and hopefully, you know, this little taste will uh, give you the image of what's involved in the entire book, and you may have the desire to pick it up. The Kindle version is free to some degree on Amazon.com. Just look up Become a Chess Champion Definitive Edition. So let's go ahead and get started. So chapter 13, tournament tips. And, you know, the number one thing you need to know for all tournaments, the number one rule, no matter what, is if you ever have a problem during a game, no matter what the problem is, pause the clock and get the attention of the tournament director. Pause the clock, raise your hand, get the tournament director. Never, ever argue with the opponent because I can't tell you how often, as a tournament director, I approach a situation and it's two people arguing. And without having any context, two people arguing vehemently, distracting the entire tournament, I'm wanting to end it as quickly as possible. But if you're handling things calmly, patiently, and like a professional, typically, more times than not, you're going to be hurt out. So, some of the essential rules. Touch, move, touch, take. If you touch a piece and you can move it, you must move it. And the touch, take rule, if you touch a piece with a piece and you can legally capture the piece, you must take it. So keep in mind, in every tournament that you guys play, if you touch a piece, you're going to have to move it if it's legal. So time rule. If you or your opponent falls below five minutes in a sudden death time control where you have been taking notation the entire game, you can stop taking notation once you or your opponent is under five minutes. Here's a big note, though. If something does happen where notation is needed, like, say, the 50 move rule, you don't have the ability to prove that 50 moves have taken place without a pawn pusher or capture making a draw. So what I recommend doing is if you're in that situation where you're not taking score and you believe that the 50 move rule will come into effect, pause the clock, get the tournament director, and ask them to start counting moves. It is an appropriate way to make sure that the 50 move rule is being followed, um, especially if you're trying to draw the game. So castling, easy rule. Regardless, because the rule book changes on this from time to time, when castling, always touch the king first. King over two, then put the rook over, never the rook first, because in some of the older editions of the book, I know that it said uh, it is the intent of the player, but honestly, real chess players castle by touching their king first. No, none of this two-handed crap either. One hand to play chess. And getting to one hand, the one hand rule. In my opinion, when you're playing a game, it is easier and more ethical to use one hand Typically, your dominant hand. In my case, I'm right-handed for the entire game. So imagine with the two-hand thing, somebody just keeping their hand on the clock and then the other move pieces with. We don't allow this, so two hands at any point in time should not be allowed, including like Nakamura castling. Not good. So in this case, one hand for everything. And the order of operations, in my opinion, is you make your move, you press the clock, then you write down notation. Because over the course of a game, if you're making your move and then writing down notation, you're losing a few seconds on every move. And in a 40 move game, that's gonna add up to a few minutes. And especially if you're playing game in 30, that's valuable. I mean, you're relatively losing 10% of your overall time in a game by taking notation on your own time. So write it down on your opponent's time. So who chooses equipment? Here's a good question. Uh, so when starting the game and two players arrive to a board and both of them want to use their set, now white gets the first move of the game, so the rules state that black gets choice of equipment, meaning set and clock. So the only time I've ever seen exception to this is if, you know, the black has a strange set, you know, pink and purple pieces, or it's not a tournament set. And I think the rule book defines a tournament set as it's around three and a quarter inch of a king to a four inch king. Um, no smaller or larger than that. And typically chess sets are sized by the uh, length of the king. So communication. 
you may talk to your opponent only on your own time. At any other time, it's considered distraction and a time penalty could be imposed. For instance, if you mess up on your chess notation, you may ask to borrow your opponent's score sheet in order to fix your notation. Other things that could happen is the proper way to offer a draw. So say, for instance, I make my move, I state on my own time, I offer a draw, and then press the clock. And then your opponent has their move to decide whether or not they're accepting the draw offer. Once they've made their move, it's done at that point. So very important. Like even, even small etiquette things, like uh, if it's your opponent's move, and you say, I adjust and start adjusting pieces, this can be considered a distraction because you're only supposed to fix off center pieces, say adjust, communicate with your opponent on your own time because it's your time to use as you see fit. A lot of players don't know. You can get up and go to the bathroom. You can walk around the room. Just don't communicate with another player and please do not use a phone or have a phone on your person. I think in modern day, where my phone with the engine on it can play stronger than Magnus Carl's in the current world champion, I don't think any player should have any reason for having their phone on their person unless it's something that's been cleared by the tournament director, like a medical condition or you're expecting some sort of important business call or you're a doctor on call. These are really the only types of excuses in my mind that should be cleared with the tournament director why anyone in modern day should have a phone on their person. Go ahead and prevent any sort of cheating accusations by just not having electronic devices. It's the easiest way to go. So here's another important one, making illegal moves in a tournament game. In the event that your opponent makes an illegal move, you pause the clock, show the illegal move to the tournament director, explain what happened, and two minutes are added to your clock if your opponent made the illegal move. So that's an important thing to know, especially in time scrambles. And in blitz, if an illegal move is made, that is an automatic loss, according to the current rules, as of September 2018. So general rules violations. If any rule violation occurs, you stop the clock and tell the tournament director. I can't tell you how often I've had a situation where a student loses a game, comes up to me upset right after the game is done, and goes, my opponent was cheating. He was getting information by somebody or fill in the blank with an excuse. And you have, you must, you must pause the clock and get the tournament director right then if any rule violation is taking place because once the game is done, there's little to nothing that can be done. So keep this in mind for the future. All right, here's one for new tournament people as well. If you need to leave early, Say you got yourself a birthday party, a soccer game. This is why, in the grand wisdom of, of the original tournament directors, they came up with the concept of the buy. If you need to leave, you let them know at the beginning of the tournament, and you can get a buy for the rounds in most tournaments that you'll play in. So you go ahead and get that buy, and you can leave and go to that soccer game. But the horrible thing is, if somebody just picks up and leaves without letting anybody know that they're leaving, they're going to be paired. And your person that you're playing against, or should have been playing against because you left, is going to sit there and have to wait for your time to run out. They came to play chess, and you cheated them out of the game. So that's not very fair or ethical. So if you need to leave early, let people know. So now we get the concept of the buy. There are a couple different types of buys. So we talked about the first, where you're requesting a half point buy. The other type of buy, so say with pairings, Logically, you need an even number of players to have an even number of games going. Well, not necessarily an even number of games, but an even number of players to have games. So that being the case, if there are, say, 11 people, well, the odd person out, typically the lowest rated, will get a full point. It's like he won a game because they reward him for not having an opponent, he or she. So what if my opponent doesn't show up? This is a common question I get. Do I get rating points if my opponent doesn't show up and they run out of time? No. If no move is played, no rating points exchange hands. But it does help you in the turn. If your opponent doesn't show up, you get a forfeit win, so you get a full point. Okay. Now on to some etiquette things. Now these are mostly opinions, but it's good to know. Like shaking hands. It's my opinion that if anyone ever extends their hand, 
for you to shake it, you do it. It's disrespectful to not shake hands. So at the beginning of games is when I recommend to my students to shake hands because I feel that it can be taken disrespectfully by a number of individuals if you just stomped them in a game. You just beat them unmercifully. And then as soon as you lay checkmate, you extend your hand, good game. I mean, it's rubbing in the win. And it may not be taken that way by a lot of people, but that's why I believe that handshakes should occur at the beginning of the game because there's no animosity. We're beginning, this is a fresh start, and I think it's a neutral ground to shake hands and no one could ever be offended by that. All right, uh, kibitzing, commenting on games in progress. This is a no, this is a never, ever, 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 ever should you talk about someone else's game. I don't care if this is Skittles when the games don't count or rated play. Um, not a fan of it, especially in my classroom. I don't allow it. All right, travel. It's a common misconception to new tournament players that you're required to stay at your board for the entire game. It's not the case. You're allowed to stand up, walk around the tournament hall, go to the bathroom. You don't have to pause the clock when you're doing these things. It's, you know, you keep the game going. The reason that we have the chess clock the reason that we use time for every tournament is to assure that all rounds will finish at a maximum point in time. And then the round's done, so you're good to go. All right, so be aware if a player is leaving the board every move and you feel he's traveling somewhere to receive assistance, again, comment to the TV, TD, rather, TV. So, again, talking about the concept of phones, being able to have engines on them playing very, very strong, 3,100 plus at this point. Um, always watch your opponent. Like, uh, usually most people stay in the tournament room when they're walking around. Go to the bathroom maybe two times, three times in a game, especially if you got the water cooler and they're taking a lot of trips. But there's really no reason why someone should be leaving the room every single move, every other move. And I believe that warrants... Um, justification to speaking to the TV, TD about it. Almost said TV again. I don't know why. All right, so space bubble. And here's a pure etiquette thing. Now, I grew up in a state to where I had older gentlemen that would want to see what I played and they'd look at my score sheet. But I'm sorry, dude, but if I can feel your breath, you're so close to me trying to look at my score sheet, you are way too close to me. Like, it's, it's all good fun when people are observing games but there is a common courtesy space bubble. And I believe that rule is, if I can reach out and touch you from my seat where I'm sitting, when I'm playing a game, you are way too close to me. You can observe a game and be arm's distance away and have absolutely no problem seeing. That's, please respect that, <laughs> that's a rough one. All right, tournament director questions. Most tournament rounds start later than advertised especially the first round, for this reason. And it can arise from a number of factors on the TD's end, but let's consider how the average tournament can play, player can help. Because even it'll be my experienced students who have played 15 tournaments, if I'm directing a tournament, they'll run up to me and they'll go, first round was supposed to start at 9 o'clock, it's 9.01. Where are the pairings? Well, I'm sorry, but when a team of 15 people just walked in, one minute before the round is supposed to start and is telling me that they want to enter the tournament. Sometimes people will turn around and go home if you don't enter them instead of giving them a half point buy. This is also why as a tournament director now I have on all of my flyers that if you arrive 30 minutes before the first round time without using registration online because I provide registration online for all of my events, you're getting a half point buy because it holds up the tournament. So asking superfluous questions at the beginning of the tournament doesn't help anybody. It just delays the tournament director because typically it's one tournament director for the event and he's working on the computer and trying to get things done. So if he's playing 20 questions with a single individual, it holds up the event for everyone in it. So unless it is an extremely important question, don't talk to the tournament director right during the initial round being paired. All right, so suggestions and strategies. Now, let's say, for instance, you have a distracting opponent. Now, 
I will say that sometimes your opponent cannot help it, and you have to be respectful of that. You got a, a fidgety opponent, you know, a opponent with obsessive compulsive disorder that has to readjust the pieces every single move to make sure that it's square. You know, you got your your magicians, the guy that has to put a flourish on a move. And I think it's extremely disrespectful to do this where, you know, he makes this move and, you know, makes makes a big theatrical scene out of it or does the corkscrew where you make your move and you just twist it in. This type of it's, – it's just crap. It's, it's non-essential and it's extremely disrespectful. Um, players who do this are typically attention-seeking and are being rude. But my recommendation, and you'll see it a lot of if you look up – Brian Tillis in Google playing chess, you'll see me in many of my tournaments sitting like this, where I've made a visor with my hands, where I'm only looking at the board. Because really that's all that exists when I'm playing a game. I'm not worried about my opponent, I'm worried about the game itself. So regardless of the behavior of your opponent, it's easier to just create a habit to not focus on them. I'm not interested in the psychological games. I'm here to play chess. So distracting opponents can come in multiple ways. And we can see here sitting with the visor, you know, and it's just one of my, my uh, thinking postures. So noise distractions, you know, like drink slurping, hacking cough, you know, the mumblers, the guys who like to have dialogue underneath their breath as a right notation. And, you know, the, the, the talkers, and it's one of my personal favorites, you know, a, a narcissistic chess player tendency. The chess players five board down have just finished their game, and they begin to analyze in the room with each other. I'm sorry, but in a room of, say, a couple hundred people, and I'm thinking as hard as I can, and you're some 1,200 that just got finished with his game, you're like, ah, yeah, you know, I got lucky there, make a draw. You can't wait until the hallway. Like, you're not the only person that exists in the world, so could you please wait to communicate until you get out? Extremely disrespectful. For all these reasons, I feel like, you know, electronic devices in the ears, it's, it's quickly going out the window because at this point, I feel if Wesley So can be forfeited for writing a motivational quote on the back of his score sheet, like, never give up, try hard, something to that effect, that anyone listening to music and otherwise... It should at least be a warning because who's to say that I can't take the time to record something like this, just an audio, to give myself opening reminders or say, say motivational things to myself the entire time. It's in the same vein of written slash non-written help, so why allow it at all? If someone doesn't want to hear something, I recommend earplugs. Cheap, effective, and completely legal. All right, so... Other things, game preparation, member service area statistics. I love the member service area. You can go to the United States Chess Federal Federation website and look up any statistics about that and use it for game preparation. Got tournament director tip in here. Whenever you're speaking with a TD, please remain calm and take turns speaking with your opponent. I put in 9 out of 10 cases from a TD's perspective. The player who is interrupting and making a scene is typically the player trying to hide something or is in the wrong. Being calm, clear, and undistracted will have the ear of anyone over screaming, crying, or accusatory behavior, which is 100% accurate. All right. I think I'm going to cut it off there. Oh, no. No, we got to go with reading pairings. All right, so... When you're getting pairings, this is one of the first questions that, that I'll, I'll get as a tournament director with someone new playing in a tournament. They'll see BD and then the number beside it. So they'll go to the second number and try to play there, and they're like, well, there's not a board 47. Well, okay, BD is board. That's your board number where you're going to be headed to. The pound number, that is your seed number in the tournament, your ranking by the rating that first came into it. So in this case, we've got former world champion Vishwanathan Anad. He was number one in the tournament versus John Kennedy, who is number nine in the tournament. So that being the case, anytime you're playing, white's name will come first, black's name will come second, and you're finding BD. BD is the most important thing and knowing which color you have. At the end of the game, the RES's result column 
you'll put one if you won and zero by your opponent if he lost. If you lost zero, your opponent won one. And if you draw, one half, one half. That's it. So, that's it. Um, I think those are the main things other than we'll hit these USCF rating categories and international titles, and we'll call that a video. So, there are many different ratings ranging all the way down to Class J, and they're basically 200-point categories. So, I believe the average rating in the United States, last time I looked at the stats, was around 1,300. And by the time you make it to 2,000, you're in the top 10% or so of chess players. The rationale for 2,200 being national master is that is the top 1% in the rating system. And by the time you're, you reach around 2,300, you're in the top 300 active players in the country. And by the time you reach 2,400, you're knocking on the door of the top 150 or so active players by USCF ratings in the country. And then above national rankings are international rankings, and we have the FIDE titles. And you can earn the candidate master title with 2,200 FIDE rating, FIDE master title with 2,300, international master with 2,400, and what's called three different norms. A norm is to ensure that a player isn't just playing low-rated players over and over and over and getting their rating up that way. Um, say, an international master norm consists of you're playing in a tournament of, say, I believe it's around nine rounds or more, and you have to play X number of players that are international masters or grandmasters, and you have to perform the way a current international master would in order to receive a norm showing that you can compete at that level. So once three tournament norms have been achieved, plus the rating of 2,400, you get the title. And the same applies for the Grandmaster title. So 2,500 and three performance norms at three separate events. One of the things they did to make it more difficult and cut down on cheating was having a situation to where... Oh, always announcements at school. So, in the situation with the norms, you have the breakdown that you got to have the three and you got to have the countries. So, you cannot play, I think more than half can't be from the same nation. And this is one of those situations to where if uh, I make a tournament and I'm a grandmaster and I've got a bunch of grandmaster friends and we have a friend that ha needs one more norm, we can all just make draws with them. And in order to dissuade things from like that from occurring, um, they made the rule to where it has to be from a number of different countries. So unless you're really friendly with everybody, you're gonna have to play some chess and earn your norms. Oh, I just keep, keep this video going, why not? List of world champions from Steinitz all the way to Carlsen, and I only put the list of classical world champions in the text. And we're ending it with Mighty Magnus Carlsen, look him up. He's a beast, best ever.